up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. Today we're going to be talking about atmospheric science, energy, and we're sitting down with Mark Jacobson, who is the director of the Environmental Science and Energy Program at Sanford and a professor there as well. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And so, I mean, your work is super important to talk about because there's no way to sustain on Earth without figuring this out. Right. Yeah, the problems of global warming, air pollution, mortality, and energy security are the three largest problems facing the world today, in my opinion. Uh, global warming may cost the world on the order of 25 to $30 trillion per year. That's trillion dollars per year by 2050. Air pollution already kills four to seven million people every year, costing the world about 20 to $25 trillion per year, including the morbidities, the illnesses along with that, hundreds of millions of more ill people as well. And then fossil fuels are limited resources. They will run out over time, and that will result in prices rising and economic, social, and political instability. So we do need to transition to something that's sustainable and clean as soon as possible. And so that's kind of what I've been working on is how to transition cities, towns, states, countries, the whole world in fact, and all the way even down to individual people's homes to 100% clean renewable energy for everything to try to solve all these problems simultaneously. So. Man, this is a whole mess. This is a whole mess that needs a whole fix. Yeah. So, okay, so the last hundred years or so especially, we've been really ramping up our energy consumption. And we've been using fossil fuels to produce our energy. And it's helped a lot with innovation, helped a lot with technology growth. And then now we're finally like, hey, like this is unsustainable. So give us the numbers again. In the trillions of dollars of hurt and also in people dying? Yeah, well, so in terms of health, air pollution health, right now, four to seven million people die every year from air pollution. And this is in cities that are very polluted, like in India and China? Yeah, most of them right now are in developing countries. Uh, it used to be that the United States, well, back actually during the Industrial Revolution, it was England and parts of Europe that had the greatest air pollution from human sources. But then that moved to the U.S. and in the 50s and 60s, uh, especially Los Angeles, was pretty much the hotbed of air pollution. And the U.S. had huge problems uh, throughout, as did other industrialized countries, especially after World War II. Uh, and, but since then, there have been strong regulations in North America and Europe in particular, and that has reduced air pollution significantly. But there's still about 65,000 premature air pollution deaths in the United States alone, about 13,000 per year in California. But that pales in comparison. Right now, China, over a million people die every year from air pollution. India, similar, close, close to similar numbers. How do we know that they're dying from air pollution? Uh, based on, there's several ways to find out. There have been epidemiological studies over the last four to five decades that where you can see from just looking at hospitalizations, how many people die on a given day, in fact, uh, correlated with air pollution levels. So you can actually find a linear trend. When air pollution goes up, more people die and are admitted to hospitals. Uh, and then you can look at the cause of death, and it's usually cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, complications from asthma. These are the These main ones, yeah. kind of deaths. Although 20% of the mortalities now worldwide are children under the age of five years old. And what happens, mm -hmm. a lot of them, they're just exposed to indoor cooking from and heating uh, using biomass or coal. I mean, a lot of people in the world still cook with coal in their homes or biomass, just burning dung or wood. And these kids, are little, have little bodies, are exposed to high levels of pollution, and they become weaker. And so they might end up dying of pneumonia, but their immune system has been weakened uh, due to this air pollution. It's an assault on their bodies. And in fact, air pollution has been correlated, well, when, if you have a heart attack, you're more likely to die of the heart attack in polluted air than non-polluted air, because these particles are just invading your lungs. The small ones get deep into your lungs, and they're just invading your body. They're assaulting it. 
any case, there's strong evidence in terms of just, uh, just from correlations from epidemiolo epidemiological studies and then looking at causes of death. It's, they're usually respiratory, cardiovascular, asthma. And th so anyway, we know that this is a significant problem and it's caused by b burning things, by combustion, and mostly particles in, in pollution. And, even, and also ozone is another source, which is a gas in air pollution. But these are preventable causes of death. I mean, if we, stop a, if we stop the emissions of the pollutants that create the particles or create the yeah. ozone, we can eliminate the, uh, the cause of the deaths immediately. In fact, the short-term ones. Some, some of the longer-term ones, you're, you're still, some people will still die residually because of the buildup over their lives. But the way to eliminate this problem is to transition, to electrify everything, yep. and then provide that electricity with clean renewable energy. And so really we, that's what we need to do on a large scale. And if we look at all the energy sectors that people, all the sectors that people use energy in, well, there's electricity, there's transportation, there's heating and cooling of buildings, and there's industry, high temperature industrial processes. So we really need to go through each one of these sectors and transition that to electricity and then provide that electricity with just clean renewable energy, namely wind and water and solar power, in our opinion. And you've modeled out what this looks like currently with emissions, and then you've modeled out what it looks like with wind, water, solar, and the mm -hmm. amount of deaths, the amount of money that's saved. I mean, the, sh just on the amount of hospitalizations that we're having um, due to this, uh, there's going to be so many new jobs as well to stimulate the economy with renewables. Um, there's lots of really good yeah. and sustainability of our planet. We just won't live if we don't do this. Right. Well, we've calculated that if you eliminate the air pollution mortalities worldwide by transitioning, you can basically save 3 to 5% of the world's gross domestic product. On top of that, you create jobs. We calculate worldwide. Well, first of all, we, we developed energy plans for 139 out of the 200 countries of the world for which we had data for. And also all 50 United States, we did separate energy plans. And now we just published 53 town and city plans uh, from North America. And we found in the world plans- We'll show you soon the our energy solution. We'll show you guys yeah. what that looks like. Because we can, it's so the links in the bio too. You guys can go and visit it. Yeah, and take a look at it. Did, now, did each individual country and state also kind of collaborate with you and say that we can do this, or have some of them said they will? Um, we, yeah, we interacted with some, but we really we developed these plans consistently, so we just basically developed a methodology and didn't have to actually consult them to come up with the final plans. But now that we have final plans, we're trying to consult with some of these governments uh, to try to actually implement them. I should just mention that all these roadmaps, the, the country roadmaps, the state roadmaps, and the city roadmaps are available with easy uh, access at thesolutionsproject.org, yep. which is a nonprofit that I helped co-found to actually take these energy plans and try to educate the public and policymakers about them. But you can go on there and find, find a, the United States and click on each state, or find a city, or find a country of the world and click on that country to up will pop an energy plan. Now, uh, basically, yeah, we, w we went through each of our 139 countries and developed plans to transition each country to 100% clean renewable energy. So we, we calculated the numbers, well, what's the growth of energy between now and 2050 based on population increases and changes of energy use and also accounting for increases in energy efficiency and improvements. Uh, under what we call a business as usual case, which is with basically with fossil fuels. And then we transitioned each energy sector to clean renewable energy. Well, we electrified each energy sector. And then we then came up with a number of wind turbines, solar panels, et cetera, to try to meet the annual average power demand for each sector in each country. So when I say electrify, for example, uh, gasoline cars, diesel cars, trucks, buses, we would electrify those so we'd have battery electric vehicles and for long distance ships, trains, trucks, and aircraft, hydrogen fuel cell, battery electric hybrids. And th these are existing technologies, except 
for airplanes, it'll be a little more, uh, take more time to actually commercialize the technology. There, there is like a hydrogen fuel cell aircraft right now that seats four people that can go 1,500 kilometers. And the calculations we've done and others have done indicate that you can have long distance aircraft that will be hydrogen fuel cell with some electric electricity as well that could, so you can have these sustained long distance flights that are based on hydrogen fuel cells as well. With, you may have a larger airplane due to the volume, but the mass is actually pretty similar. Uh, so and hydrogen some, fuel cell is a, a sustainable form of energy. Yeah, so the hydrogen, and it's, it's a chemical reaction, so the only product of a hydrogen fuel cell is water vapor, and as opposed to jet fuel right now, which puts out soot, black carbon, organic, other organic gases, uh, oxides of nitrogen, sulfur, as well as huge amounts of water vapor, much larger than actually the water vapor from the hydrogen fuel cells that would replace it. And so the uh, current aircraft create contrails, which a lot of people don't like because they crisscross the sky and they affect the climate as well. And so we would reduce, we did still have water vapor, but there are no particles coming from the hydrogen fuel, fuel cell aircraft. So as a result, there, the contrail sizes are much smaller and you eliminate all the other emissions associated with, uh, with fossil fuel combustion. Uh, but the hydrogen itself would be created from electricity by passing electricity through water and the electricity would be wind, water, or solar. So this would be a very sustainable uh, system as well. And just keep in mind, I mean, the, most rockets, including the space shuttles, uh, were propelled into space with hydrogen, but hydrogen combustion, combustion rather, than, yeah. rather than fuel cells. But, okay, so transportation, we can cover, the, it'll take the longest to get aircraft and some long distance ships as well, but everything else we can do, I think, pretty rapidly. And then industry, we'd electrify that. You just need high temperatures for certain processes, and we'd get those high temperatures, instead of burning coal and gas and fuel oil, uh, we would get it with electric uh, arc furnaces, induction furnaces, dielectric heaters. These are all existing technologies that are all already used in industry. They just need to expand them throughout the rest of industry. And then for heating for your home, uh, we would eliminate gas air, uh, heaters for air heating and water heating, and even eliminate electric resistance heating. We'd replace all heating with heat pumps for both air and water heating. Heat pumps are much more efficient than other types of heating. What is that? So a heat pump, so it, it moves the air from either outside, moves hot air from outside to inside, or it can be run in reverse where it takes cold air from outside and moves it inside. But what if the, the outside is hot and then you want to cool the inside? Yeah, so it even, even if the air outside is hot, there's still, you can extract cold, some cold from outside air. Mm. It just becomes less efficient the hotter the temperature is. Mm -hmm. And, but there, and if, you get, or if you're in a really extreme climate where it's extremely hot, like in a desert, or extremely cold, uh, like where, when there's snow on the ground, instead of extracting the heat from the air, you can extract it from the ground. So there's, there's what, call, what are called air source heat pumps, where you extract heat from the air outside your house, or ground source heat pumps, where you extract the heat from the ground. And it used to be the ground source heat pumps were really expensive because you'd have to excavate your whole backyard and put coils and try to extract heat over this reservoir uh, in your backyard. But now there's a new technology where you can just drill straight down. And uh, there's this company called Dandelion that uh, they just have a technology that you can drill straight down, extract the heat. And it's, so the cost has actually come down so it's equivalent to the air source heat pumps, which are equivalent to your gas heater. Now, just to give an example, I recently built my own home and it's been over a year now, and I electrified it so there's no gas on the property, and that saved me about $6,000 of a hookup fee just to, the, my utility wanted to charge me $6,000 just to hook gas up from the property line onto my property. And in addition to that, there are pipes that I avoided. I didn't need gas pipes, and I never need fuel to pay for, I never need to pay for gas fuel. So instead, everything was electric, had solar on my roof, batteries in the garage, and electric cars to replace gasoline cars, heat pumps for air heating, air conditioning, and water heating. They use one-fourth the energy as 
gas heater for either. And instead of a gas stove, an electric induction cooktop. It's not an electric resistance stove. A lot of people don't like electric resistance stoves because they don't heat up very fast. It's hard to control the temperature. But induction cooktop stove, which is also electric, it actually boils water in half the time as gas does. And you can control the temperature really easily. And also, you can touch the stove, and it's not even hot. And so it has all these advantages, and it's about the same cost as a gas stove, but there's no fuel. You don't need gas fuel. You just need electricity. And, and then very efficient lights. So I basically have, a, have an electric home that during the day it uses solar. Solar on the rooftop powers pretty much everything, except if, if I need extra, then I, there's, uh, the solar goes to, there's solar stored in the battery, so the battery turns on. So at night, for example, the battery will turn on and I'll use uh, the battery electricity. And only if the battery runs out, then do I need grid electricity. So over the last year, or over a one-year period ending last March, this, this March, I had no electricity bill, no gas bill, natural gas bill, and no gasoline bill at all. Instead, I overgenerated my electricity for the home by 20%. In other words, I produced 20% more electricity than I used for everything, including electric cars, heating, cooling, lights, television, everything. And that was sent back to the grid. The grid, now they have these community choice aggregation utilities that will pay you for your electricity at the time that it was generated, which, could be the, which is usually the peak time of the day until you get the peak rate. They sent me a check for $528. So I paid no bills and got a check back. And this is a fully electric home. And so, Dr. Jacobson, how do you expect the rulers of the world to stay in charge with all this skating the system and not profiting off of energy? Well, there's still ways that utilities profit off the energy. Uh, I mean, first of all, they can go into the energy business themselves because you can, like, I have solar on my roof, but a utility can, it's, it's actually more, the, the cost for me is the upfront cost. Why can't we just work together and create our own energy system and get, them, get rid of the middleman? That's what yeah. I'm saying. You know, that, it's just such a corrupt system. And well, talk to me about free energy suppression. What about the energy that's just out there that they're just not, you know, that the pyramids kind of grab into? No? Did you, have you heard about these things? Are they teaching well, you that at Stanford? Well, I think there's, it's a good idea to be able to control your own energy, but it's actually, it, there is some benefits of ha being on a grid too, even if, there, even if although creating, like I'm controlling most of my own energy, but there are times of the year when I need energy from the grid. And, and it's, I could get off the grid completely, but they, you know, it becomes an asymptotically expensive product. I just need a lot more batteries and more solar to do that. Whereas the, if the grid were cleaned up as well, then uh, you know, everybody could be 100% clean renewable energy, be at 100% clean renewable energy. So I think it's a combination of having your own, providing your own power. There's a benefit of having rooftop solar for everybody uh, to generate 90 to 95% of their own power, but there's also a benefit of having additional grid electricity uh, because you can actually do grid electricity less expensively in terms of the upfront costs. Because just to give you an idea, you know, right now the cost of, the cost of energy from, let's say, natural gas is around six cents a kilowatt hour, six cents per kilowatt hour for electricity from natural gas. Whereas solar at the utility scale for the big solar plant, is on the order, in sunny places, on the order of three to four cents a kilowatt hour. And wind is even cheaper in the, in the United States right now. It's on the order of two and a half to three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. It's the cheapest form of new electricity available. So you can, but a rooftop solar might be 12 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So, Interesting. So it's actually more efficient for us to stay on the grid because we can get it from these places that have a better concentration during uh, certain hours. For for example, for wind, it's just a better place to get wind energy. For solar, it's a better place to get solar energy than it is for to get it on the rooftop. So if I get it via the grid, it's actually more efficient and more cheap. But then again, I can also still get some solar collection from my roof, power my house as well, and then 
you were describing earlier the importance of the all of these different aspects of the house, from the heat pump to the solar roof to all of these energy efficiencies that happen in the home. And then that decreases the cost significantly. And then you also have the, the credits that come in as well. And right. people can get paid for that. Um, also, the, you know, Ron mentioned this as well. There's a lot of this like free energy suppression that's kind of happened. Um, what did Tesla discover? What are we not tapping into? that is so invisible to us, but that could potentially enable us to... Well, maybe you're not at liberty to talk about these things. I would think that would be a big secret, this free energy suppression. You know, do you, do you have children, Dr. Jacobson? I do. Yeah, you don't have to elaborate on that question. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, th I think there's, there's enough resource of known energy clean renewable energy that we can power the entire world. So we don't, I mean, we, there's the sun, the wind, water, you know, these are energy sources that are natural, that are replenishable, that we can take advantage. Uh, I want to just make one point about the rooftop solar. Mm -hmm. Although it's more expensive to install, it's actually because you can sell it back to the grid at the peak time of the day at a very high rate. Yep. It's, the, it's really, what you're concerned about is the bottom line, like how much money do I pay for it versus how much money do I collect over my lifetime? Yep. And when you do that analysis, you'll find that, you know, solar panels on your roof, they have a high upfront cost, but they're warranted for like 30 years, at least in places in California and in a lot of places in the U.S., they're warranted for 30 years. They pay themselves off after around seven years. And so it's after that, it's free. So it doesn't matter if it's like the, what the cost per kilowatt hour is. It really matters how much money you have in your pocket at the end of the day. And you're going to have a lot of money at the end of, in your pocket at the end of the day because even though it's cost, it costs a lot to put it up, you're getting money paid back to you. And the value of it when you're using it is very high. Whereas if you're buying grid electricity, you're paying a low price for it, but you're not getting any money back. So it does balance itself up in that, in that respect. But, you know, there's, I think we try to focus on, well, what are the known solutions? What are the, what are, what's a viable way we can do it with, you know, almost all existing technologies? So we're not looking for, like, um, some real surprise or looking for, like, some new technology that, because a lot of people really want to hold out until there's some new great technology that's going to just solve all our problems. We don't want to do that. We want to... Focus, we have to solve this problem immediately. We need 80% of the problem to be solved within 12 years from now, and 100% within by 2050, which is basically 32 years. So, but 80% by 2030, we cannot wait for a miracle technology to solve this problem. We have to use the technologies that are viable, that we think can be approved, but are existing today. And and we've run the numbers and we think it's possible, not only to power every state and country and city in the annual average, but we've also done what we call grid integration studies where we look at time dependent matching power supply with demand every 30 seconds for several years. And we've done this, in fact, for, because we developed plans for 139 countries, we broke those countries into 20 world regions and then did a study looking at, can we actually match power demand with supply every 30 seconds for five years in each of these 20 world regions? And we found, yes, it's possible with storage. So the storage is another part of that, which includes batteries, but also what's called concentrated solar power has storage associated with it, pumped hydroelectric power for electric storage, uh, existing hydroelectric reservoirs, they're basically big batteries you can turn on and off to generate power. But also heat storage, like in water and rocks underground, and cold storage in water and ice, and hydrogen is a form of storage as well. So by combining storage with electricity production from wind, water, solar, and also when the utilities give people incentives to use electricity or not use it at certain times of the day, like for example, uh, you know, if, what's the peak time of electricity use is in the late afternoon often in certain places. Well, if you actually 
make the electricity price high at that time and make it lower at night, which they do right now, then that shifts people's demand for electricity to night. So like, for example, I charge my electric car you know, after 11 p.m. because that's when the, electric, the, when the electricity price is lowest. And so that's when I would charge it. Um, and so similarly, a wastewater treatment plant, it doesn't need to run at you know, 4 and 5 in the afternoon. It's, it's going to run less expensively if it runs at night or other hours. So that's called demand response. And that's a way to mm -hmm. try to match power demand with supply on the grid. That's cool. And so, all right, so we take this next 12-year period, and this next 12-year period has got to be, like you said, not just waiting for miracle technology. It's got to be what we already know, um, wind, water, or solar, and actually implementing those at high frequency and most efficiency across the world for energy consumption. And then this sort of uh, demand that comes onto the grid, we're, we're kind of we're kind of gamifying it a little bit with the people that with from the grid to the end user by saying that, hey, there's the most pull on the grid at this time. What if you waited and plugged your car in at the end of the night instead of at what, right when you came home? But then they're like, oh, well, then that gives me another thing to put on my to-do list, but then it costs you more money to do it. You're running your dishwasher at 11 p.m. instead of at 7 when you finish dinner. There's all these different types of uh, when do you do your laundry? When do you use your water for that? So this is a, and maybe the smart appliances will just do it for us at the time when the energy's cheapest. Yeah, actually, that's the next step. I mean, I have an irrigation system. It's run on a timer, so you can run it on your phone, like when you want to, when it, when you want it to run. So you don't actually have to go out, physically turn things on and off. Dishwashers can be the same way. I mean. Right now, I do actually manually turn it on and off when I want to run it, when the electricity price is lowest. But I think that's a pretty trivial step to make it automatic, uh, to automatically run at certain times. And same with other things. I mean, your, my car charging, I can do it remotely too. I don't have to actually, I can ch plug the, the charger into my car right now any time of the day and then set it to charge at certain, PM. yeah, 11 yeah. p.m. Yeah. And so the, the, this is something that's becoming more and more automatic and regular and if efficient. And this is and this is good. I mean, but it, it's interesting though. A lot of these devices, though, like the dishwasher or even a washing machine. I mean, they're actually n not using nearly as much energy or electricity as they used to. The new ones are very much more energy efficient. Uh, so that, that's a good part of it too, energy efficiency, especially light bulbs. I mean, light bulbs are just much more, they use like 1 50th the energy as they used to, uh, with the LED light bulbs. So you can, so, so it, it, I don't want to encourage anybody to waste energy by just keeping your lights on, but it's just really beneficial. I mean, the energy demand uh, is so much lower with just new technologies. Yeah. And I think mostly across the board. Uh, and I want to show some of the slides that you said that we should also show. Um, <clears throat> and let's discuss them as well. So the WWS is wind, water, solar. Right. And that solution is now being implemented thanks to the our energy solution. And you're you were talking about transportation as one of the main aspects of this, um, heating, cooling with water pumps or with heat pumps. Um, and you kind of tapped, you kind of touched on a bunch of this as you went along, which is good. Right. Um, well, Ron, what do, we, what do we have next as well? Yeah, so this is types of storage systems we would use you along with the- You did this, yeah. Yeah, along with the energy production, so electricity storage with concentrated solar power, that's CSP, uh, and pumped hydroelectric power, existing hydroelectric dams, batteries, heating, cooling, storage in water, yep. ice and rocks. Okay, um, and then, yeah, I'm just, the like, storage is so important along the way, and to figure out what is the best storage method, um, were lithium ions pretty good right now? Yeah, they're, they're excellent. I mean, the only disadvantage is they're still relatively expensive, but actually, you know, it's not that bad for your own home because, for example, in my home, I have 
a bunch of solar panels that cost a lot initially, and there are two active batteries doing, you know, solving most of my problems. And these two batteries are three thousand dollars each, so it's six thousand dollars, you know. But that's on the order of maybe fifteen percent of the solar PV cost. And even though you know it's not making me totally energy independent of the grid, it's making me ninety to ninety-five percent energy independent of the grid. And so, for example, here's here's an example of seven days of energy use from my home and from the summer. And the green is solar production. The light blue is use in the home of some of that sunlight to run things in the house. Yeah. The dark blue, well, and then during the day, when I'm finished running things in the house, some of the electricity from the solar goes to charge the battery. So the bottom here shows the battery being charged each day and then discharging at night. And then at night, the battery turns on, and that's the dark blue. So you can see the red, well, by the way, the red is the grid electricity. And you can see there's yeah. hardly any grid electricity. The only right. times there's grid electricity being used is when I'm charging the cars. There's two cars. One takes faster charge than the other but I don't have enough in the battery to charge the car. Mm -hmm. So there I use grid electricity. But as I mentioned before, averaged over the year, I generated 20% more electricity than I used yeah. and then got paid back. paid back. So in this case, you know, so in this case I'm, you know, I'm using some from the grid, but I'm generating more because all that different, the difference between that green and the blue all goes back to the grid. Yep. In this case, yep. How great is it to generate more electricity than you use? Oh, That's it great. feels really good. It's yeah. because I'm helping other people on the grid with clean energy as well yeah. as providing clean energy in my own home. Yep. Um, this is a uh, an important graph because it actually summarizes our 139 country plans. So it has the sum of all 139 countries. What it indicates is that in 2012 there were 12 trillion watts of power demanded for end use purposes in 139 countries of the world. These represent more than 99% of all the emissions worldwide, or 99% of the countries with 99% of the emissions. In 2050, that's expected to grow to about 21 terawatts. Damn. It's a huge growth. Trillion watts? Yeah, a trillion watts of power. And that's a, ter a terawatt? Is, yeah. Oh my gosh. But if we electrify, everything that's so much energy use. well that won't happen if we go forward with the uh, depopulation agenda you know down to 500 million we should be good to go <laughs> no aren't they working on that have you heard about that dr jacobson uh <laughs> not that particular plan mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah you're talking about how fossil fuel industry you know kills a million people a year you say it like it's a bad thing it's just it's it's crazy that with seven and a half billion people that we're still increasing our energy consumption so much and we're just now really transitioning to sustainable <coughs> forms of energy on massive scales because that's a, that's a huge jump that's almost double yeah everyone's going to want to live like an american on the planet <laughs> right well the nice thing is though if we electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean renewable energy we can get down to 8.6 terawatts without any, anybody changing their habits and how, how would we get down to 8.6 Yeah, terawatts? I'll, I'll tell you in a sec, but that's 58% yeah. reduction. So our, that's huge, yeah. our plan would be give you a 58% reduction of power demand. So let me start with this one, energy self-use. 12.6% of all the energy worldwide is used just to mine, transport, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. Oh my gosh. So if we go to wind, water, sun, the sunlight comes right to the panels, the wind comes right to the turbines. We don't need to search for the underground. We don't need to dig, drill, and use energy for that. So that's 13% of energy is saved by eliminating fossil fuels. Another 23% reduction due to the fact that you know, fossil fuels have a lot of embedded heat. In other words, when you burn uh, gasoline in your car, only 17 to 20% of the energy in the gasoline goes to move your car. The rest is just waste heat that gets heats up the it's environment around you. It's that inefficient? It's 20%? Yeah, yeah. It's 80% inefficient. That's so bad. <laughs> it's horrible. But an electric car, 80 to 86% of the electricity in the car goes to move the car, and the rest is waste heat. So you actually, if you electrify everything, electrify transportation, you reduce your power demand, your end-use power demand, which uh, by about 75%. And so it's a huge reduction in that sector. But when you average over all energy sectors, 
you actually get a lesser reduction of about 23% reduction of power demand just due to the efficiency of electricity over yeah. combustion. And then going to heat pumps. Sweet, 15 minute timer. Thank you, Ron. All right. Going to heat pumps, there, every heat pump compared to a gas heater it reduces your power demand by a factor of four. But averaged over all energy sectors, because heating is only, and cooling are only a portion of the total energy use, we can eliminate about 16% of energy just by going to heat pumps for all heating and cooling of buildings and refrigeration and, and heating of, of water, et cetera. And then we get another 7% just by uh, pushing the limits of end use energy efficiency improvements and reducing energy use beyond what's expected in the business as usual case. This is, this is great and I love the, the plan. And I love, like, uh, let's, let's definitely highlight our energy solution. Um, I still want to understand uh, heat pumps better as well because yeah. I want to understand how to take a hot aired environment and find cool air in there and pump it into the, into the building. I, well, we'll, I'll, we'll, 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 uh, ex we'll explain and learn more. Is there, is there um, a good point here as well that we should well, highlight? Yeah, this is how much land is required to power basically the world, because this represents more than 99% of the energy, with just wind, water, and solar for all purposes. And so the bottom line is we would need for the utility scale, well, for rooftop PV, that does not count as new land because it's just going on existing rooftops. Mm. But utility scale photovoltaics and concentrated solar power, that's about 0.22% of the world's land. Mm. And then onshore wind is about 0.92% of the land for the spacing between the turbines, but that spacing can be used for multiple purposes, such as agricultural land. So we only need 1% of the land of the 139 countries? To power the whole world for everything. And keep in mind, though, that the current fossil fuel industry, like in the United States, there are- And that's wind, water, solar. That's wind, water, and solar for all energy sectors. The fossil fuel industry, well, in the United States, there are 1.7 million active oil and gas wells, and there are 2.3 million inactive ones. So there are 4 million total. They take up 1 to 2% of the United States land area, including the wells, the well pads, the storage facilities, the roads associated with these, the wells. Refineries, yeah, gas not even counting, Not even counting those. We haven't even got to those. So just, just the... Damn. Gas and oil That's infrastructure in the U.S. It's one to two percent. So this is one percent, a little over one percent of the world's land, for everything, for all energy. And so we think it's going to take less land than the current energy infrastructure. Yeah, I'm lo I'm looking forward to continuing to explore these calculations because this is so crucial to do the transition. Do we have another? Do we have more slides, Ron? Well, this was just the cost of energy. It's a little complicated, but it's the cost of energy resulting uh, when you account for the keeping the grid stable with wind, water, solar. Uh, the current fossil fuel industry in the electric power sector, it, the direct cost of energy is 9.8 cents a kilowatt hour, mm -hmm. which is relatively low. But there's a fuel health, sorry, there's a health cost associated with fossil fuels due to air pollution mortality. Yeah, and then people get hospitalized. Die, and, or, yeah. well, that's 12.7 cents a kilowatt hour. There's an 2050 climate cost that will be about 16 cents a kilowatt hour. So the total what we call social cost of fossil fuels is 38 cents a kilowatt. And you were hour. listing the kilowatt hour pricing is already down to like two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Well, that's for, yeah, for that's solar. for the that's for the cost of the just the wind or just the solar, but not the whole keeping the grid stable, not the storage, okay. not the transmission distribution. And that would be closer to 10 cents yeah, a so, hour? So in the wind, water, solar case for the electric power sector, it's about 9.7 cents a kilowatt hour overall when you count for everything, including the generation, the transmission distribution, and the storage. And then there's no health cost but there's or no health climate cost. cost. So we're but, comparing but, this to this. But then there is also a recycling cost. The photovoltaics get better over time, so you'll want to recycle your solar panels for better ones, yeah. and wind turbines will become more efficient, and hydroelectricity yeah. will and also. Keep in mind that these like wind turbines, solar panels, they, they last on the order of, of 25, 30 years. And then, yeah, they would be recycled, but that's included in the cost of the energy. Yeah, to, that's much better than a plastic water bottle that's one time right. use and you just toss it 30, 25, right. 30 years. Yeah. But the other interesting thing is okay, so this is 9.7 cents per kilowatt hour, but remember I mentioned that we use 50% fewer kilowatt hours in the wind water solar case because it's more efficient. So you use 50% less energy 
due to the efficiencies that I mentioned before, the eliminating energy in the mining, transporting, and refining fossil yeah. fuels, the efficiency of electricity over combustion. So the amount, it's really one-eighth the cost. This is one-fourth of that. Mm -hmm. But because we use 50% fewer kilowatt hours, the consumer is going to pay one-eighth oh. as in the fossil fuel system. And then they can sell back to the grid with energy efficiencies as well. Well, yeah, there's other, other yeah. collateral benefits too. What, so. what, what do we have up, Ron, up next? Now, this was interesting. So we haven't really talked about, well, what do people think Why about Why is this number plans? not 100% want a world with 100% renewable <laughs> energy? Well, I think if you look at the second one, only 66% of the people in these, this poll, this is a, a poll of 26,000 people in 13, 13 countries, and only 66% believe climate change is a global challenge. So it's actually pleasantly surprising, though, given this number, that 82% want a world with 100% renewable energy average over all these countries. But I mean, who are the 18% of people that don't understand that we need a world powered by renewable energy to move forward? Well, probably some of them are people working in the fossil fuel industry and they're, you know, a lot of people- yeah. have Those that. dirty rat bastards. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Ron was saying earlier. Who are the people suppressing the progress to renewables? There's a lot of money to be made. That's why there's a lot of suppression that's going on. Yeah, it's, well, there are a lot of people who are either invested in the current energy infrastructure or they support, it's just they're kind of ingrained because they've been fed lots of bad things about renewable energy. Um, awesome, so we got a bunch of cities so, committed to 100% yes. renewables. So nice thing is they're actually, even though our federal government in the United States is not doing a lot towards promoting 100% clean renewable energy, not, in fact, doing nothing to promote. Are those numbers in order? Is like Burlington, Vermont leading the way? Um, no. <laughs> yeah, there's just alphabetical. No, yeah. no, it's oh. not even alphabetical. It's, it's just even, kind of yeah. random. Alpita <laughs> Springs is down here. It's not. Yeah, yeah but it's, but just, it's just, good. There's a good amount of California representation on here, which is good. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there are actually even more now. There's closer to 70 since I did the slide. Uh, cities in the United States, towns and cities, and these include big ones and small ones, like Atlanta, Georgia, San Francisco, Madison, Wisconsin, San Diego, and uh, but also small country, uh, small cities and towns like Boone, North Carolina, Moab, Utah, Beta Springs, Louisiana. Yeah, these little guys coming in. Chitlin Switch is Chitlin Switch, Georgia, in there? Not yet. <laughs> I'm working on them. <laughs> I'm working on it. Yeah, Boone. But, but these, um, but these are like city councils have voted, like some often unanimously, to, renewables. to go to 100% renewables in their either city operations or in trying to get the whole town or city to go to 100%. And then they're in some part of their transition there. What do we got? What else we got? And then companies committed. This is good. Now the question is how, how much are these cities and these companies committed? You know, where exactly are they in their process well, to getting there? Yeah, so there are over 130 companies worldwide. These are international companies and most of the major companies of the world have committed. And like Google and Apple, claim that they've already reached that 100% target for all their operations. So all their data centers, all their buildings are now theoretically, according to them, powered with 100% clean, clean renewable electricity. Either they've bought wind farms or solar farms, or like in the case of Google also has solar spread over, out over all their roofs. Mm -hmm. and Can we plug Ecosia, the browser? Have you heard of them, Dr. Jacobson? Which one? There's a browser that, um, that if you use, they donate their profits to uh, renewable energy yeah. to save trees or something like that. Are you familiar with that? No, no, I'm not familiar. With okay, that. sorry. Great. Yeah, there uh, is a web browser that does that. Yeah. E Ecosia, E C O S I A is yeah, the name. Ecosia, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, that yeah, is yeah. what they're called. Okay, I'll get want, in touch with them for I, I, I uh, sponsorship. Make, I want to make sure that uh, that we do show the our energy solution as well. Okay. Um, do we have one? We have another one, Ron. Well, oh, summary of yeah, this was just a summary of our 139 country plans about what that would do, create 24 million more jobs than are lost. These are long-term full-time jobs, require you know, modest amounts of uh, land area, eliminate four to seven million air pollution deaths per year, slow then reverse global warming. We think we can keep the grid stable with 100% clean renewable energy. Uh, the wind, water, solar energy cost is slightly less just in terms of direct cost but the energy plus health and climate cost is one fourth. And when you account for the fewer kilowatt hours used, it's one eighth the cost of a fossil fuel system. So this is, it's really like little downside to such a transition. Yeah, uh, we were talking about the beginning, the immense amount of jobs that are created, the immense 
cost a drop, the avoiding of death, the uh, of, of hospitalizations and the slow transition to renewables. Right. Um, so this is the, you know, this is your site, the solutions right. um, And so on here, you can just browse by country. So if you click open the United States, 100% United States of America, vision for transition, 100% wind, water, solar, residential rooftop, solar plants, concentrating solar plants, shore wind. So you know, you even show construction job and operations jobs over a 40 year period that are created. Right. The reduction in energy demand, health cost savings. This is great. It's a very relatable infographic. It's really well designed. Money in your pocket that you get to take. And then the other good thing is you can just go, okay, boom, China. How about China? Yeah, we, that's, we're trying to make it easy. I mean, the numbers are there's a lot, lot more information. There are detailed spreadsheets that, if anybody's interested, can access through one of the websites or I think you're going to post. But we try to distill the information to give you what are some, what are some of the important numbers and try to make it easy to, to understand. Because people, I mean, most people are not going to be interested in the details. And I should point out that these are, you know, the end, use, the end plans that are developed in each of these countries may not look like this, but this is like one way to get there and really serves as motivation uh, to inspire uh, countries, policymakers, as well as individuals to say, well, this is possible to do in each country. Let's see if we can, this is one way to do it, so let's see if we can try this way. But they might well find that there's actually a more efficient way or a different, different pathway because of some other limitation. Uh, but we do believe that there's at least one way in each country to get there. It seems like the amount of countries that need to actually visit the site and visit the solutions project and then reach out and figure out how to collaborate is huge. Um, we, there's also the, you know, the sustainable development goals that they can collaborate with along the way. There's a couple of these sustainability projects around the world that are going on that um, if we're able to combine our, um, our minds uh, and to the transition, I think it'll make it a much more seamless and more efficient transition. Oh yeah, well the nice thing is there are lots of nonprofits that are working together with our solutions project to try to you know, implement a transition uh, worldwide and educate the public. And they're, and they're individuals, I mean, from that public opinion poll, I mean 80%, over 80% of the people in the world want to change. So that means a lot, that so many people want to change. So that, that's what's driving these changes in individual cities and towns, and even in the companies as well. And this should only grow over time as the need becomes more important, as we're seeing the impacts of climate change getting worse and worse in particular. And people really, especially in these developing countries, want to eliminate this air pollution that's killing a large portion of their populations. Yep. I like to ask, especially 24 years now professing in civil and environmental engineering, um, I like to ask professors what one of their favorite parts is about expanding the minds of young people that they teach. Well, the nice thing is, I mean, I, I teach on climate, I teach on air pollution, I teach on energy. And, and we have a program called Atmosphere Energy where students can understand the problems and the solutions. And so it's really been gratifying for me to see that we have now on the order of 400 master's degree graduates and plus, on, under, plus undergrads over the last uh, 14 of these years, because that's when we started the program. And they're all out there, at least students are out there now as mm -hmm. professionals working in energy or air pollution or government agencies and industry, uh, high tech, and it's really nice to see that they are influencing, they are then influencing others around them and helping to drive this transition as well. So this is really nice to see uh, that it's not just like, it's not just a few people. I mean, all these the studies I talked about here, we have over 85 of our students and also other researchers at other universities oh, yeah. have contributed to these studies. So this is a large body of people totally. that have helped with this and have really contributed. And so it's invented it as well. So it gives me great pride to know that a lot of our students have done such great things and are now you know, working with others to help this transition. I'm just imagining Mark just 
sitting and just looking at all of the different paths that all the students have taken and just right. seeing their impacts and just having a little tear come down there. Yeah, so yeah, I think I, that is a very beautiful part of being, of professing and of uh, enriching people's minds to, and seeing what they do with it that we would have never thought of. Once right. you teach, they go off and do something really interesting, creative with it. Like you said, it takes a village. It's taking a massive village of people from around the world to really crunch all of this together to make it happen. Right, right. So this has been a good conversation about our transition to 100% um, renewable world. Now, I, I, I really wanted to ask you, because you said like earlier you were just that... Um, we can't just go with the miracle technology, but like, just, you know, figuring out how to, you know, get nuclear fusion working seems so awesome. Of course, not tomorrow, but by 2050. Why do you bring up nuclear all the time? You know, he didn't say anything about nuclear technology in this whole program. Not a thing. Why do you have to bring that up? We don't need nuclear technology. Forget about it. Let it go away. Yeah, don't, the, don't bring it up again. <laughs> the, the, the fusing of atoms is actually huge for the potential. Do you energy. know what happened in Fukushima? How does your fish taste? Well, he's, he's actually talking about different technology than the fish. Oh, the sorry. Fishes. All right, but never mind. A, I'm, I hate myself. I wish I was <laughs> never like born. A, but, well, okay, f so fusion is, yeah, when you when atoms come together and, and release energy, and that's, you need temperatures that are like in the su middle of the sun. I mean, that's how- That's how the sun works. The sun works yeah. is basically through nuclear fusion. And I mean, so it's not, it doesn't have all the same impacts. It doesn't have the same impacts as fission, which is all nuclear reactors today. So it's not, but it's, it's something that people have thought, well, maybe it'll be available soon, but Projections are it might not still be available for a hundred years from now, even you if, think if it is that long. Well, in terms There's of commercialized like reactor that you know that spins the um, atoms and collides them in a plasmic form. I'm just trying to learn more and more about this. It's so hard to yeah, understand. I think you can. Well, I don't know all the details of what's the latest research, but there's a difference between even doing the research and commercializing something and making totally, it Totally, because you have to have the energy in be less than the energy that you get out. Yeah. Right? And then that has to consistently happen in a safe way. But I'm just, I, I, I really want to see the, you know, like you said, wind, water, solar, these are the easy ones. We know they're safe. We know how to do right. them. We've been doing them. So let's do the transition in that sense, but also do R&D into things like fusion along the way as well would be something yeah. I'd be very excited uh, yeah, about. Yeah, people are not going to stop, stop doing R&D no matter what I say. No matter <laughs> what we say, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, we, I'm not going to, I won't be against it. I just think, I think nuclear fission is a problem uh, because it not only, I mean, just ignoring all the th current things of weapons proliferation, meltdown risk, waste mining risk, uh, what do you do with all the waste? You tell them. It's just expensive and yeah. it takes long to put up. So you can be one o nuclear all you want, but it takes, it takes between 11 and, or sorry, 10 to 19 years between planning and operation of a single nuclear reactor yeah. And it's like costs like five times totally, more. Totally, big difference between fission and fusion and definitely not as interested in fission, of course. Um, okay, so let's ask a couple questions leading out. Um, first one, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? <laughs> this is, well, I think there are many other planets in the solar system, not in our solar system, planets in other solar systems that are reasonably close to the sun, not too close, not too far, because like, you know, the reason we have life on Earth is because of the Goldilocks hypothesis yeah. that, you know, Mars is too cold or Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, and Earth is just right, the right mm -hmm. distance. So there are probably other cases where there's a planet the right distance from this, this, the sun in that solar system. So there's, I think there's a good chance there's probably life somewhere, but I think we'll never find it because all the other solar systems are so far away that it just takes... No, we're not going to find it because it's a secret. Yeah, it's That's why we're not going to find it. <laughs> and then... Uh, Thanks what, for your input. What about the... Do you think we're in a simulation? We're in a simulation. 
No, I don't think we're. Oh, the, I don't feel. I don't feel like I'm in a. <laughs> since I since I build simulations. You build <laughs> simulations exactly. <laughs> I don't think I could actually simulate something so complicated as what we're doing. <laughs> oh, don't sell yourself short, sure. Doctor Jacob. Said you're a uh, smart man. I know, but it's like there's not enough computer time. That's the problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the. It's not the. It's like you can actually represent the the physics of it, but. It requires I, I just, a lot of energy and a lot of math. The computer, the computer processors are just like, just not even orders of magnitude, many orders of magnitude too slow. Soon. To, Soon. <laughs> we'll see if we get that. Give it a hundred years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then how about, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, well, nature, but that's pretty obvious, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think. What I aspect? Just, I mean, I I don't know, just, there's just natural, I, I just like na nature scenes of water running over rocks. Just some things that are yeah. picturesque, you know, trees growing, plants, beautiful flowers. I, I yeah. haven't pinned down the, the, most, the most beautiful thing, but I've just seen a lot of beautiful photographs that I really enjoy. I mean, in terms of, if I look at kind of human made things, it's basically certainly you know, wind turbine, solar panels, Storage. I mean, I really like that vision of powering the earth. something, the earth, with something sustainable. Totally. So, Likewise. So that that makes me feel good. It's from yeah, human human uh, technologies. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's almost like like you drew and you guys drew in your graphics that the fossil fuel burning is all like black and gray, and then the mm -hmm. uh, wind, water, and solar is all uh, yellow and green and blue, and right, and, right. and it's like with the colors of Earth versus the colors of death. Almost, I can imagine opening up one of the per people's lungs that are hospitalized and just being like, "Oh, oh man!" Yeah. I have pictures of people's lungs that have exposed to Los Angeles air pollution in the '70s, and it's like smoking. Then I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, living in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's not cool, and and that's Los Angeles. That's not even the highly polluted air cities of. India and China as well. And I think they're doing a much better job at cleaning it up. The world's moving in the right direction, but we need more people like you and more people that are really trying to push us in the, in the form of uh, renewable energy for our world, following that path. Mark, thank you so much yeah. for joining us on the show. All right, thank you for having me on the show. It's what a pleasure. pleasure, yes. And we have some great links in the bio for you to check out, of course, our energy solution. That's .org, right? TheSolutionsProject.org. TheSolutionsProject.org. The energies in the er, links in the bio. Um, of course, also definitely do check out uh, Mark on Twitter as well, uh, MZ Jacobson on Twitter. Um, other links to the um, atmospheric and energy program will be down there. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. If you guys had a good time, definitely go share this content with two other people. Let's get more and more people talking about this. Go and write about it. Go make a video about it. So don't just consume, go create with it. Join us on Patreon. Help join the community. Subscribe, comment below. We'd love for, your, uh, for you guys to join. Thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Woo!